1. The Day the World Ended <clears throat> Call me Jonah. My parents did, or nearly did. They called me John. Jonah, John, if I had been a Sam, I would have been a Jonah still. Not because I've been unlucky for others, but because somebody or something has compelled me to be in certain places at certain times without fail. Conveyances and motives, both conventional and bizarre, have been provided, and according to plan, at each appointed second, at each appointed place, this Jonah was there. Listen. When I was a younger man, two wives ago, 250,000 cigarettes ago, and about 3,000 quarts of booze ago, when I was a much younger man, I began to collect material for a book to be called The Day the World Ended. The book was to be factual. The book was to be an account of what important Americans had done on the day when the first atomic bomb had dropped on Hiroshima, Japan. It was to be a Christian book. I, I was a Christian then. I am a Buchananist now. I would have been a Buchananist then if there had been anyone to teach me the bittersweet lies of Buchanan, but Buchananism was unknown beyond the gravel beaches and coral knives that ring this little island in the Caribbean Sea, the Republic of San Lorenzo. We Buchananists believe that humanity is organized into teams, teams that do God's will without ever discovering what they're doing. Such a team is called a carass by Buchanan, and the, and the instrument, the can-can, that brought me into my own particular carass was the book I never finished, the book to be called The Day the World Ended. End of one. This is Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, one of his earliest, one of his earlier books, um, content warnings for, let me think, some old-fashioned uh, references to little people that are not, that are not entirely in good taste, uh, mostly just the use of the word midget, um, one of the characters is a little person, and there's a lot of use of the word midget, but there's not, I don't think, anything uh, like full-on hate speech about that character, or that condition. Um, I can't think of anything else. I guess I'll let you know if I do. Chapters. Uh, the style of this book is that Chapters are extremely short. They often only about two pages, and there are, as a result, uh, like 150 of them. <coughs> Chapter two. Nice, nice, very nice. If you find your life tangled up with somebody else's life for no very logical reason, writes Bakonin, that person may be a member of your caress. At another point in the books of Bacon, and he tells us, Man created the checkerboard. God created the caress. By that he means that a caress ignores national, institutional, occupational, familial, and class boundaries. It is as freeform as an amoeba. In his 53rd Calypso, Bacon invites us to sing along with him. Oh, a sleeping drunkard up in Central Park, and a lion hunter in the jungle dark, and a Chinese dentist, and a British queen, all fit together in the very same machine. Nice, nice, very nice. Nice, nice, very nice. Nice, nice, very nice. So many different people in the same device. Chapter 3, Folly. Nowhere does Bakonin warn against a person trying to discover the limits of his caress and the nature of the work God Almighty has had it do. Bakonin simply observes that such investigations are bound to be incomplete. In the autobiographical section of the books of Bakonin, he writes a parable on the folly of pretending to discover, to understand. He writes, I once knew an Episcopalian lady in Newport, Rhode Island, who asked me to design and build a doghouse for her Great Dane. The lady claimed to understand God and his ways of working perfectly. She could not understand why anyone would be puzzled about what had been or, what was, or about what was going to be. And yet, when I showed her a blueprint of the doghouse I proposed to build, she said to me, I'm sorry, but I never could read one of those things. Give it to your husband or your minister, or pass it on to God, I said. And when God finds him in it, I'm sure he'll explain this doghouse of mine in a way that even you can understand. <laughs> she fired me. I shall never forget her. 
She believed that God liked people in sailboats much better than he liked people in motorboats. She could not bear to look at a worm. When she saw a worm, she screamed. She was a fool, and so am I. And so is anyone who thinks he sees what God is doing. End of chapter 3. Chapter 4. A Tentative Tangling of Tendrils. Be that as it may, I intend in this book to include as many members of my caress as possible, and I mean to examine all strong hints as to what on earth we, collectively, have been up to. I do not intend that this book to be a tract on behalf of Baconanism. I should like to offer a Baconanist warning about it, however. The first sentence in the books of Baconan is this. All of the true things I'm about to tell you are shameless lies. My Baconanist warning is this. Anyone unable to understand how a useful religion can be founded on lies will not understand this book either. And so be it. About my caress, then. It surely includes the three children of Dr. Felix Hunnaker, uh, one of the so-called fathers of the first atomic bomb. Dr. Hunnaker himself was no doubt a member of my caress, though he was dead before my sinukas, the tendrils of my life, began to tangle with those of his children. The first of his heirs to be touched by my sinukas was Newton Hunnaker, the youngest of his three children, the younger of his two sons. I learned from the publication of my fraternity, the Delta Upsilon Quarterly, that Newton Hunnaker, son of the Nobel Prize physicist Felix Hunnaker, had been pledged by my chapter, the Cornell chapter. So I wrote this letter to Newt. <coughs> Dear Mr. Hunnaker, or should I say, Dear Brother Hunnaker, I am a Cornell DU, now making my living as a freelance writer. I am gathering material for a book relating to the first atomic bomb. Its contents will be limited to events that took place on August 6, 1945, the day the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Since your late father is generally recognized as having been one of the chief creators of the bomb, I would very much appreciate any anecdotes you might, come, you might care to give me of life in your father's house on the day the bomb was dropped. I'm sorry to say that I don't know as much about your illustrious family as I should, and so I don't know whether you have brothers and sisters. If you do have brothers and sisters, I should very much like to have their addresses so I can send similar requests to them. I realize that you were very young when the bomb was dropped, which is all to the good. My book is going to emphasize the human rather than the technical side of the bomb, so recollections of the day through the eyes of a baby, if you'll pardon the expression, would fit in perfectly. You don't have to worry about style and form. Leave all that to me. Just give me the bare bones of your story. I will, of course, submit the final version to you for your approval prior to publication. Fraternally yours. Chapter 5. A letter from a pre-med. <clears throat> to which Newt replied, I'm sorry to be so long about answering your letter. That sounds like a very interesting book you're doing. I was so young when the bomb was dropped that I don't think I'm going to be much help. You should really ask my brother and sister, who are both older than I am. My sister is Miss Harrison C. Connors, uh, 4918 North Meridian Street, Indianapolis, Indiana. That's my home address, too, now. I think she'll be glad to help you. Nobody knows where my brother Frank is. He disappeared right after Father's funeral two years ago, and nobody's heard of him since. For all we know, he may be dead now. I was only six years old when they dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, so anything I remember about that day, other people have helped me to remember. I remember I was playing on the living room carpet outside my father's study door in Ilium, New York. The door was open, and I could see my father. He was wearing pajamas and a bathrobe. He was smoking a cigar. He was playing with a loop of string. Father was staying home from the laboratory, from the laboratory in his pajamas all day that day. He stayed home whenever he wanted to. father, as you probably know, spent practically his whole professional life working for the research laboratory of the General Forge and Foundry Company in Ilium. When the Manhattan Project came along, the bomb project, father wouldn't leave Ilium to work on it. He said he, would, he wouldn't work on it at all unless they let him work where he wanted to work. A lot of the time, that meant at home. The only place he liked to go outside of Ilium was our cottage on Cape Cod. Cape Cod was where he died. He died on Christmas Eve. You probably know that, too. Anyway, I was playing on the carpet outside his study on the day of the bomb. My sister Angela tells me that I used to play with little toy trucks for hours, making motor sounds going all the time. So I guess I was going 
on the day of the bomb, and Father was in his study playing with a loop of string. It so happens that I actually know where the string he was playing with came from. Maybe you can use it somewhere in your book. Father told the string. Father took the string from around the manuscript of a novel that a man in prison had sent him. The novel was about the end of the world in the year 2000, and the name of the book was 2000 A.D. It told about how mad scientists made a terrific bomb that wiped out the whole world. There was a big sex orgy when everybody knew that the world was going to end, and then Jesus Christ himself appeared ten seconds before the bomb went off. The name of the author was Marvin Sharp Holderness, and he told Father in a covering letter that he was in prison for killing his own brother. He sent the manuscript to Father because he couldn't figure out what kind of explosives to put in the bomb. He thought maybe Father could make suggestions. <laughs> I told me to tell you I read the book when I was six. We had it around the house for years. My brother Frank made it his personal property on account of the dirty parts. Frank kept it hidden in what he called his wall safe in his bedroom. Actually, it wasn't a safe, but just an old stove flue with a tin lid. Frank and I must have read the orgy part a thousand times when we were kids. We had it for years, and then my sister Angela found it. She read it and said it was nothing but a piece of dirty, rotten filth. She burned it up and the string with it. She was a mother to Frank and me because our real mother died when I was born. My father never read the book, I'm pretty sure. I don't think he ever read a novel or even a short story in his whole entire life. Or at least not since he was a little boy. He didn't read his mail or magazines or newspapers either. I suppose he read a lot of technical journals, but to tell you the truth, I can't remember my father reading anything. As I say, all he wanted from that manuscript was the string. That was the way he was. Nobody could predict what he was going to be interested in next. On the day of the bomb, it was string. Have you ever read the speech he made when he accepted the Nobel Prize? This is the whole speech. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you now because I never stopped dawdling like an eight-year-old on a spring morning on his way to school. Anything can make me stop and look and wonder, and sometimes learn. I am a very happy man. Thank you. Anyway, Father looked at that loop of string for a while, and then his fingers started playing with it. His fingers made the string figure called a cat's cradle. I don't know where Father learned how to do that, from his father, maybe. His father was a tailor, you know, so there must have been thread and string all around, all the time when Father was a boy. Making that cat's cradle was the closest I ever saw my father come to playing what anybody else would call a game. He had no use at all for tricks and games and rules that other people made up. In a scrapbook my sister Angela used to keep up, there was a clipping from the Time magazine where somebody asked father what games he played for relaxation. And he said, why should I bother with made-up games when there are so many real ones going on? He must have surprised himself when he made a cat's cradle out of the string, and maybe it reminded him of his own childhood. He all of a sudden... He all of a sudden came out of his study and did something he'd never done before. He tried to play with me. Not only had he never played with me before, he had hardly ever spoken to me. But he went down on his knees on the carpet next to me and showed me his teeth, and he waved the tangle of string in my face. See? 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 He asked. Cat's cradle. See the cat's cradle? See where the nice pussycat sleeps? Meow. Meow. His pores looked as big as craters on the moon. His ears and nostrils were stuffed with hair. Cigar smoke made him smell like the mouth of hell. So close up, my father was the ugliest thing I'd ever seen. I dream about it all the time. And then he sang, rock a bye cat see in the treetop. He sang, when the wind blows, the cradle will rock. If the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. Down will come cradle, catsy and all. I burst into tears. I jumped up and I ran out of the house as fast as I could go. <clears throat> I have to sign off here. It's after two in the morning. My roommate just woke up and complained about the noise from the typewriter. End of chapter five. Chapter 6. Bug Fights Newt resumed his letter the next morning. He resumed it as follows. 
Next morning, here I go again, fresh as a daisy after eight hours of sleep. The fraternity house is very quiet now. Everybody's in class but me. I'm a very privileged character. I don't have to go to class anymore. I was flunked out last week. I was pre-med. They were right to flunk me out. I would have made a lousy doctor. After I finish this letter, I think I'll go to a movie. Or if the sun comes out, maybe I'll go for a walk through one of the gorges. <sighs> Aren't the gorges beautiful? This year, two girls jumped into one holding hands. They didn't get into the sorority they wanted. They wanted Tri-Delt. But back to August 6, 1945. My sister Angela has told me many times that I really hurt my father that day when I wouldn't admire the cat's cradle, when I wouldn't stay there on the carpet with my father and listen to him sing. Maybe I did hurt him, but I don't think I could have hurt him much. He was one of the best protected human beings who ever lived. People couldn't get at him because he just wasn't interested in people. I remember one time, about a year before he died, I tried to get him to tell me something about my mother. He couldn't remember anything about her. Did you ever hear the famous story about breakfast on the day mother and father were leaving for Sweden to accept the Nobel Prize? It was, the, it was in the Saturday Evening Post one time. My mother cooked a big breakfast, and when she cleared off the table, she found a quarter and a dime and three pennies by father's coffee cup. He'd tipped her. After, war after wounding my father so terribly, if that's what I did, I ran out into the yard. I don't know where I was going until I found my... I didn't know where I was going until I found my brother Frank under a big spurea bush. Frank was 12 then, and I wasn't surprised to find him under there. He spent a lot of time under there on hot days, just like a dog. He'd make a hollow in the cool earth all around the roots. And you never could tell what Frank would have under the bush with him. One time he had a dirty book. Another time he had a bottle of cooking sherry. On the day they dropped the bomb, Frank had a tablespoon and a mason jar. What he was doing was spooning different kind of bugs into the jar and making them fight. The bug fight was so interesting that I stopped crying right away. Forgot all about the old man. I can't remember what all Frank had fighting in the jar that day, but I can remember the other bug fights we staged later on. One stag beetle against a hundred red ants. One centipede against three spiders. Red ants against black ants. They won't fight unless you keep shaking the jar. That's what Frank was doing. Shaking. Shaking the jar. After a while, Angela came looking for me. She lifted up on one side of the bush, and she said, So there you are. She asked Frank what he thought he was doing, and he said, Experimenting. That's what Frank always used to say when people asked him what he thought he was doing. He always said, Experimenting. <laughs> Angela was 22 then. She had been the real head of the family since she was 16, since Mother died, since I was born. She used to talk about how she had three children, me, Frank, and Father. She wasn't exaggerating, either. I can remember cold mornings when Frank, Father, and I would all be in a line in the front hall and Angela would be bundling us up, treating us exactly the same. Only I was going to go to kindergarten, Frank was going to junior high, and Father was going to work on the atom bomb. I remember one morning like that when the oil, oil burner had quit, the pipes were frozen, and the car wouldn't start. We all sat there in the car while Angela kept pushing the starter until the battery was dead. And then Father spoke up. You know what he said? He said, I wonder about turtles. What do you wonder about turtles? Angela asked him. When they pull in their heads? When they pull in their heads, he said. Do their spines buckle or contract? Angela was one of the unsung heroes of the atom bomb, incidentally, and I don't think the story has ever been told. Maybe you can use it. After the turtle incident, Father got so interested in turtles that he stopped working on the atom bomb. Some people from the Manhattan Project finally came out to the house to ask Angela what to do. She told them to take away Father's turtles. So one night they went to his laboratory and stole his turtles in the aquarium. Father never said a word about the disappearance of the turtles. He just came to work the next day and looked for things to play with and think about. And everything there was to play with and think about had something to do with the atom bomb. When Angela got me out from under the bush, she asked what had happened between Father and me. I just kept saying over and over again how ugly he was, how much I hated him. She slapped me. How dare you say that about your father, she said. He's one of the greatest men who ever lived. He won the war today. Do you realize that? He won the war. She slapped me again. I don't blame Angela for slapping me. Father was all she had. She didn't have any boyfriends. She didn't have any friends at all. She had only one hobby. She played the clarinet. I told her again how much I hated my father. She slapped me again. And then Frank came out from under the bush and punched her in the stomach. It hurt her something awful. She fell down and she rolled around. When she got her wind back, she cried and yelled for Father. He won't come, Frank said, and he laughed at her. Frank was right. 
Father stuck his head out a window, and he looked at Angela and me rolling on the ground, bawling, and Frank standing over us laughing. The old man pulled his head indoors again, and never even asked later what all the fuss had been about. People weren't his specialty. Uh, will that do? Is, is any of that help to your book? Of course, you've really tied me down, asking me to stick to the day of the bomb. There are lots of other good anecdotes about the bomb and father from other days. For instance, do you know the story about father on the day they tested the bomb out in Alamogordo? After the thing went off, after it was a sure thing that America just could just wipe out a city with just one bomb, a scientist turned to father and said, Science has now known sin. And you know what father said? He said, What is sin? All the best, Newton Hunnaker. End of chapter six. Chapter 7. The Illustrious Hunnickers. Newt added these three postscripts to his letter. <clears throat> P.S. I can't sign myself fraternally yours because they won't let me be your brother on account of my grades. I was only a pledge. Now they're going to take even that away from me. P.P.S. You call our family illustrious, and I think you would maybe be making a mistake if you called it that in your book. I am a midget, for instance, four feet tall. In the last we heard of my brother Frank, he was wanted by the Florida police, the FBI, and the Treasury Department for running stolen cars to Cuba on war surplus LSTs. So I'm pretty sure illustrious isn't quite the word you're after. Glamorous is probably closer to the truth. PPPS. 24 hours later. I have reread this letter, and I can see where somebody might get the impression that I don't do anything but sit around and remember sad things and pity myself. Actually, I'm a very lucky person, and I know it. I'm about to marry a wonderful little girl. There is love enough in this world for everybody, if people will just look. I am proof of that. Chapter 8. Newt's Thing with Zinka. Newt did not tell me who his girlfriend was, but ab about two weeks after he wrote to me, everybody in the country knew what her name was. It was Zinka. Plain Zinka. Apparently she didn't have a last name. Zinka was a Ukrainian midget, a dancer with the Borzois Dance Company. As it happened, Newt saw a performance by that company in Indianapolis before he went to Cornell. And then the company danced at Cornell. When the Cornell performance was over, little Newt was outside the stage door with a dozen long-stemmed American beauty roses. The newspapers picked up the story when little Zinka asked for political asylum in the United States. And then she and little Newt disappeared. One week after that, little Zinka presented herself at the Russian embassy. She said Americans were too materialistic. She said she wanted to go back home. Newt took shelter in his sister's house in Indianapolis. He gave one brief statement to the press. It was a private matter, he said. It was an affair of the heart. I have no regrets. What happened is nobody's business but Zinka's and my own. One enterprising American reporter in Moscow making inquiries about Zinka among dance people there made the unkind discovery that Zinka was not, as she claimed, 23 years old. She was 42, old enough to be Newt's mother. Chapter 9, Vice President in Charge of Volcanoes I loafed on my book about the day of the bomb. About a year later, two days before Christmas, another story carried me through Ilium, New York, where Dr. Felix Hunnaker had done most of his work, where little Newt, Frank, and Angela had spent their formative years. I stopped off in Ilium to see what I could see. There were no live Hunnickers left in Alien, but there were plenty of people who claimed to have known well the old man and his three peculiar children. I made an appointment with Dr. Asa Breed, vice president in charge of the research laboratory of the General Fortune Foundry Company. I suppose Dr. Breed was a member of my caress, too, though he took a dislike to me almost immediately. Likes and dislikes have nothing to do with it, says Bukonan, an easy warning to forget. 
I understand you were Dr. Honecker's supervisor during most of his professional life, I said to Dr. Breed on the telephone. On paper, he said. I don't understand, I said. If I actually supervised Felix, he said, that I'm ready now to take charge of volcanoes, the tides, and the migrations of birds and lemmings. The man was a force of nature no mortal could possibly control. Chapter 10. Secret Agent X-9 Dr. Breed made an appointment with me appointment with me for early the next morning. He would pick me up at my hotel on his way to work, he said, thus simplifying my entry into the heavily guided research laboratory. So, I had a night to kill in Ilium. I was already in the beginning and end of a nightlife in Ilium, the Del Prado Hotel. Its bar, the Cape Cod Room, was a hangout for whores. As it happened, as it was meant to happen, Buchanan would say, the whore next to me at the bar and the bartender serving me had both gone to high school with Franklin Hunnaker, the bug tormentor, the middle child, the missing son. The whore, who said her name was Sandra, offered me delights unobtainable outside of the Palace Pigalle in Port Said. I said I wasn't interested, and she was bright enough to say that she wasn't really interested either. As things turned out, we had both overestimated our apathies, but not by much. Before we took the measure of each other's passions, however, we talked about Frank Honecker, and we talked about the old man, and we talked a little about Asa Breed, and we talked about the General Forge and Foundry Company, and we talked about the Pope and birth control, about Hitler and the Jews. We talked about phonies, we talked about truth, we talked about gangsters, we talked about business. We talked about the nice poor people who went to the electric chair. We talked about the rich bastards who didn't. We talked about the religious people who had perversions. We talked about a lot of things. We got drunk. The bartender was very nice to Sandra. He liked her. He respected her. He told me that Sandra had been chairman of the class colors committee at Ilium High. Every class, he explained, got to pick distinctive colors for itself in its junior year. And then it got to wear those colors with pride. What colors did you pick? I asked. Orange and black. Those are good colors. I thought so. Was Franklin Honecker on the class colors committee too? Where did my sound go? Oh, it's buffering. That sucks. He wasn't on anything, said Sandra scornfully. He never got on any committee, never played any game, never took any girl out. I don't think he ever even talked to a girl. We used to call him Secret Agent X-9. X-9? You know, he, he was always acting like he was on his way between two secret places, could never talk to anybody. Maybe he really did have a very rich secret life, I suggested. Nah. Nah, sneered the bartender. He was just one of those kids who made model airplanes and jerked off all the time. <laughs> Alright, I'll be right back. Chapter 11. Protein. He was supposed to be our commencement speaker, said Sandra. Who was? I asked. Dr. Honecker, the old man. What did he say? He didn't show up. So you didn't get a commencement address? Oh, we got one. Dr. Breed, the one you're going to see tomorrow, he showed up, all out of breath, and he gave some kind of talk. What did he say? Uh, he said he hoped a lot of us would have careers in science, she said. She didn't see anything funny in that. She was remembering a lesson that had impressed her. She was repeating it gropingly, dutifully. He said that the trouble with the world was... She should stop and think. The trouble with the world was... She continued hesitatingly. That people were still superstitious instead of scientific. He said if everybody would study science more, there wouldn't be all the trouble there was. He said science was going to discover the basic secret of life someday, the bartender put in. He scratched his head and frowned. Didn't I read in the paper the other day where they'd finally found out what it was? I missed that, I murmured. I saw that, said Sandra, about two days ago. 
That's right, said the bartender. What is the secret of life? I asked. I forget, said Sandra. Protein, the bartender declared. They found out uh, something about protein. Yeah, said Sandra, that's it. End of chapter 11. I'm going to go ahead and do one more. Chapter 12 is a nice number to end off on. Chapter 12, End of the World Delight. An older bartender came over to join our conversation in the Cape Cod room of the Del Prado. When he heard that I was writing a book about the day of the bomb, he told me what the day had been like for him, what the day had been like in the very bar in which we sat. He had a W.C. Fields twang and a nose like a prized strawberry. I never heard W.C. Fields speak. <laughs> Shit, I should have done that. It wasn't the Cape Cod room then, he said. We didn't have all these fucking nets and seashells around. It was called the Navajo teepee in those days. It had Indian blankets and cow skulls on the walls. It had little tom-toms on the tables. People were supposed to beat on the tom-toms and they wanted service. They tried to get me to wear a warp on it, but I wouldn't do it. A real Navajo Indian came in here one day told me the Navajos didn't live in teepees. That's a fucking shame, I told him. Before that, it was the Pompeii room with busted plaster all over the place, but no matter what they call the room, they never changed the fucking light fixtures. Never change the fucking people who come in or the fucking town outside, either. The day they dropped Hunniger's fucking bomb on the Japanese, a bum came in and tried to scrounge a drink. He wanted me to give him a drink on account of the world was coming to an end. So I mixed him an end-of-the-world delight. Gave him about a half pint of creme de menthe and a hollowed-out pineapple with a whipped cream and a cherry on top. There, you pitiful son of a bitch, I said to him. Don't ever say I never did anything for you. Another guy came in, and he said he was quitting his job at the research laboratory. He said anything a scientist worked on was sure to wind up a weapon one way or another. He said he didn't want to help politicians with their fucking wars anymore. His name was Breed. I asked him if he was any relation to the boss of the fucking research laboratory. He said he fucking well was. He said he was the boss of the research laboratory's fucking son. And that'll be the end of the beginning of Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut. Um, I really like this book, but being that it's a Vonnegut book, um, and its characters are told in a very, in a very true-to-life way, where the author doesn't give the impression of, you know, knowing more about them than his character was, I think it takes a minute for everybody to fall in place, and for it to really feel like we're going somewhere, you know, but... I mean, it's a really great book. Even when, it, even before in these early chapters where it doesn't quite feel like we're really going somewhere with the plot, like, it's still just very entertaining. You know, it's a really nice book to read. There's definitely a premise, right? But, yeah, I really enjoy it. So next time we'll be starting from chapter 13, which is called... The Jumping Off Place. <laughs> Chapter 13, The Jumping Off Place. Oh, God, what an ugly city Ilium is. Oh, God, says Buchanan. What an ugly city every city is. Sleet was falling through a motionless blanket of smog. It was early morning. I was riding in the London sedan of Dr. Asa Breed. I was vaguely ill, still a little drunk from the night before. Dr. Breed was driving. Tracks of a long-abandoned trolley system kept catching the wheels of his car. Breed was a pink old man, very prosperous, beautifully dressed. His manner was civilized, optimistic, capable, serene. I, by contrast, felt bristly, diseased, and cynical. I had spent the night with Sandra. My soul seemed as foul as smoke from burning cat fur. I thought the worst of everyone, and I knew some pretty solid. And I knew some pretty sordid things about Doctor Asa Breed, things Sandra had told me. Sandra told me everyone in Ilium was sure that Doctor Breed had been in love with Felix Hunnicker's wife. She told me that most people thought Breed was the father of all three Hunnicker children. Do you know Ilium at all? Doctor Breed suddenly asked me. This is my first visit. It's a family town. Sir? There isn't much in the way of nightlife. Everybody's pretty much... Everybody's life pretty much centers around his family and his home. Uh, that that sounds very wholesome. 
It is. We have very little juvenile delinquency. Good. Ilium has a very interesting history, you know. That's very interesting. It used to be the jumping off place, you know. Sir? For the Western Migration. Oh. People used to get outfitted here. That's very interesting. Just about where the research laboratory now is now was the old stockade. That's where they held the public hangings, too, for the whole county. I don't suppose crime paid any better then than it does now. There was one man they hanged here in 1782 who had murdered 26 people. I've often thought somebody ought to do a book about him sometime. George Minor Moakley. He sang a song on the scaffold. He sang a song he'd composed for the occasion. What was the song about? You can find the words over at the Historical Society if you're really interested. I just wondered about the general tone. He wasn't sorry about anything. Some people are like that. Think of it, said Dr. Breed. 26 people he had on his conscience. The mind reels, I said. Got pages stuck together. Chapter 14. When automobiles had cut glass vases. My sick head wobbled on my stick on my stiff neck. The trolley tracks had caught the wheels of Dr. Breed's glossy Lincoln again. I asked Dr. Breed how many people were trying to reach the General Forge and Foundry Company by 8 o'clock. He told me 30,000. Policemen in yellow rain capes were at every intersection, contradicting with their white-gloved hands what the stop-and-go signs said. The stop-and-go signs, garish ghosts in the sleet, went through their irreverent tomfoolery again and again, telling the glacier of automobiles what to do. Green meant go, red meant stop, orange meant change and caution. Dr. Breed told me that Dr. Hunnaker, was a very, as a very young man, had simply abandoned his car in alien traffic one morning. The police, trying to find out what was holding up traffic, he said, had found Felix's car in the middle of everything, its motor running, a cigar burning in the ashtray, flesh, fresh flowers in the vases. Vases? It was a marmot about the size of a switch engine. It had little cut glass vases on the doorposts, and Felix's wife used to put fresh flowers in the vases every morning. And there was that car in the middle of traffic. Like the Marie Celeste, I suggested. The police department hauled it away. They knew whose car it was, and they called out Felix, and they told him very politely where his car could be picked up. Felix told them they could keep it, that he didn't want it anymore. Did they keep it? No, they called up his wife, and she came and got the marmon. What was her name, by the way? Emily. Dr. Breed licked his lips, and he got a faraway look, and he said the name of the woman, of the woman so long dead, again. Emily. Do you think anybody would object if I used the story about the Mormon in my book? I asked. As long as you don't use the end of it. The end of it? Emily wasn't used to driving the Mormon. She got into a bad wreck on the way home. It did something to her pelvis. The traffic wasn't moving just then. Dr. Breed closed his eyes and tightened his hands on the steering wheel. And that was why she died when little Newt was born. Chapter 15. Merry Christmas. The research laboratory at the General Forge and Foundry Company was near the main gate of the company's Ilium Works, about a city block from the executive parking lot where Dr. Breed put his car. I asked Dr. Breed how so many people worked for the research laboratory. Sorry, how many people worked for the research laboratory? 700, he said. But less than 100 are actually doing research. The other 600 are all housekeepers in one way or another. And I am the chiefest housekeeper of them all. When we joined the mainstream of mankind in the company street, a woman behind us wished Dr. Breed a Merry Christmas. Dr. Breed turned to peer benignly into the sea of pale pies, identified the greeter as one Miss Francine Pefko. Miss Pefko was 20, vacantly pretty, and healthy. A dull normal. In honor of the dulcitude of Christmas time, Dr. Breed invited Miss Pefko to join us. He introduced her as the secretary of Dr. Nilsik Horvath. 
He then told me who Horvath was. The famous surface chemist, he said. The one who's doing such wonderful things with films. What's new in surface chemistry? I asked Miss Pefko. God, she said. Don't ask me. I just type what he tells me to type. And then she apologized for having said God. Oh, I think you understand more than you let on, said Dr. Breeden. <laughs> Not me. Miss Pefka wasn't used to chatting with someone as important as Dr. Breed, and she was embarrassed. Her gait was affected, becoming stiff and chicken-like. Her smile was glassy, and she was ransacking her mind for something to say, finding nothing in it but used Kleenex and costume jewelry. Well, rumbled Dr. Breed expansively. How do you like us, now that you've been with us how long? Almost a year? You scientists think too much, blurted Miss Pefko. She laughed idiotically. Dr. Breed's friendliness had blown every fuse in her nervous system. She was no longer responsible. You all think too much. A winded, defeated-looking woman in filthy coveralls trudged beside us, hearing what Miss Pefko said. She turned to examine Dr. Breed, looking at him with helpless reproach. She hated people who thought too much. At that moment, she struck me as an appropriate representative for almost all mankind. The other woman's expression implied that she would go crazy on the spot if anybody did any more thinking. I think you'll find, said Dr. Breed, that everybody does about the same amount of thinking. Scientists simply think about things in one way, and other people think about things in others. Eh, gurgled Miss Pefko emptily. I take dictation from Dr. Horvath, and it's just like a foreign language. I don't think I'd understand, even if I was to go to college. And Harry's maybe talking about something that's going to turn everything upside down and inside out, like the atom bomb. When I used to come home from school, Mother used to ask me what happened that day. And I'd tell her, said Miss Pefko. Now I come home from work and she asked me the same question. And all I can say is... Miss Pefko shook her head and let her crimson lips flap slackly. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. If there's something you don't understand, urged Dr. Breed... Ask Dr. Horvath to explain it. He's very good at explaining. He turned to me. Dr. Hunnaker used to say that any scientist who couldn't explain to an eight-year-old what he was doing was a charlatan. Then I'm dumber than an eight-year-old, Miss Pefko mourned. I don't even know what a charlatan is. Chapter 16. Back to Kindergarten. We climbed the four granite steps before the research laboratory. The building itself was adorned brick and rose stories. We passed between two heavily armed guards at the entrance. Miss Pefko showed the guard on the left the pink confidential badge at the tip of her left breast. Dr. Breed showed the guard on her right the black top secret badge on his soft lapel. Ceremoniously, Dr. Breed put his arm around me without actually touching me, indicating to the guards that I was under his august protection and control. I smiled at one of the guards. He did not smile back. There was nothing funny about national security. Nothing at all. Dr. Breed, Miss Pefko, and I moved thoughtfully through the laboratory's grand foyer to the elevators. Ask Dr. Horvath to explain something sometime, said Dr. Breed to Miss Pefko. See if you don't get a nice, clear answer. <laughs> He'd have to start back at the first grade, or maybe even kindergarten, she said. I missed a lot. We all missed a lot, Dr. Breed agreed. We'd all do well to start over again, preferably with kindergarten. We watched the laboratory's receptionist turn on the many educational exhibits that lined the foyer's walls. The receptionist was a tall, thin girl, icy, pale. At her crisp touch, lights twinkled, wheels turned, flasks bubbled, and bells rang. Magic, declared Miss Pefko. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear a member of the laboratory family using that brackish medieval word, said Dr. Breed. Every one of those exhibits explains itself. They're designed so as not to be mystifying. They're the very antithesis of magic. The very wad of magic? The exact opposite of magic. Yeah, you couldn't prove it by me. Dr. Breed looked just a little peeved. Well, he said, we don't want to mystify. At least give us credit for that. <laughs> the poor, extremely awkward interactions with Miss Pefko are a legendary part of this book. Poor Miss Pefko. I feel so bad. Chapter 17. The Girl Pool Dr. Breed's secretary was standing on her desk in his outer office, trying, tying an accordion-pleated Christmas bell to the ceiling fixture. 
Look here, Naomi, cried Dr. Breed. We've gone six months without a fatal accident. Don't you spoil it by falling off that desk. Miss Naomi Faust was a merry, desiccated old lady. I suppose she'd served Dr. Breed for almost all his life. And her life, too. She laughed. I'm indestructible. Even if I did fall, Christmas angels would catch me. They've been known to miss. Two paper tendrils, also accordion pleated, hung down from the clapper of the bell. Miss Faust pulled one. It unfolded stickily and became a long banner with a message written on it. Here, said Miss Faust, handing the free end to Dr. Breed. Pull it the rest of the way, and tack the end of the bulletin board. Dr. Breed obeyed, stepping back to read the banner's message. Peace on Earth, he read out loud heartily. Miss Faust stepped down from her desk. This is an old copy. With the other tendril unfolding it. Goodwill toward men, the other tendril said. By golly, chuckled Dr. Breed. They've dehydrated Christmas. This place looks festive, very festive. And I remember the chocolate bars for the girl pool, too, she said. Aren't you proud of me? Dr. Breed touched his forehead, dismayed by his forgetfulness. Thank God for that. It slipped my mind. We mustn't ever forget that, said Miss Faust. It's a tradition now. Dr. Breed and his chocolate bars for the girl pool at Christmas. She explained to me that the girl pool was the typing bureau in the laboratory's basement. The girls belonged to anybody with access to a dictaphone. All year long, she said, the girls of the girl pool listened to the faceless voices of scientists on dictaphone records, records brought in by male girls. Once a year, the girls left their cloister of cement block to go a-caroling to get their chocolate bars from Dr. Asa Breed. They serve science, too, Dr. Breed testified. Even though they may not understand a word of it, God bless them, every one. End of chapter 17. Chapter 18, The Most Valuable Commodity on Earth When we got into Dr. Breed's inner office, I attempted to put my thoughts in order for a sensible interview. I found that my mental health had not improved. And when I started to ask Dr. Breed questions about the day of the bomb, I found that the public relations centers in my brains had been suffocated by booze and burning cat fur. Every question I asked implied that the creators of the atomic bomb had been criminal accessories to murder most foul. Dr. Breed was astonished, and then he got very sore. He drew back from me and grumbled. I gather you don't like scientists very much. I wouldn't say that, sir. All your questions seemed aimed at getting me to admit that scientists are heartless, conscienceless, narrow boobies, indifferent to the fate of the rest of the human race, or maybe not really members of the human race at all. That's putting it very strong. No stronger than what you're going to put in your book, apparently. Oh, I thought that what you were after was a fair, objective biography of Felix Hunnaker. Certainly as significant a task as a young writer could assign himself in this day and age. But no, you've come here with preconceived notions about mad scientists. Where did you ever get such ideas? From the funny papers? From Dr. Hunnaker's son, to name one. Which son? Newton, I said. I had little Newt's letter with me, and I showed it to him. How small is Newt, by the way? Uh, no bigger than an umbrella stand, said Dr. Breed, reading Newt's letter and frowning. The other two children are normal? Of course. I hate to disappoint you, but scientists have children just like anybody else's children. I did my best to calm down Dr. Breed, to convince him that I really was interested in an accurate portrait of Dr. Hunnaker. I've come here with no other purpose than to set down exactly what you tell me about Dr. Hunnaker. Newt's letter was just a beginning. And I'll balance it off against whatever you tell me. I'm sick of people misunderstanding what a scientist is, what a scientist does. I'll do my best to clear up the misunderstanding. In this country, most people don't even understand what pure research is. Uh, I'd appreciate if you'd tell me what it is. It isn't looking for a better cigarette filter or a softer face tissue or a longer-lasting houseplant. God help us. Everybody talks about research, and practically nobody in this country is doing it. We are one of the few companies that actually hires men to do pure research. 
when most other companies brag about their research, they're talking about industrial hack technicians who wear white coats and work out of cookbooks and dream up an improved windshield wiper for next year's Oldsmobile. But here, here, and shockingly few other places in this country, men are paid to increase knowledge, to work toward no end but that. That's very generous of General Forge and Foundry Company. Nothing generous about it. New knowledge is the most valuable commodity on Earth. The more truth we have to work with, the richer we become. Had I been in Baconinus then, that statement would have made me howl. Chapter 19. No more mud. Do you mean, I said to Dr. Breed, that nobody in this laboratory is ever told what to work on? Nobody ever suggests what they work on? People suggest things all the time, but it isn't in the nature of a pure research man to pay any attention to suggestions. His head is full of projects of his own, and that's the way we want it. Did anybody ever try to suggest projects to Dr. Honecker? <laughs> Certainly. Admirals and generals in particular. They looked upon him as a sort of magician who could make America invincible with a wave of his wand. They brought all kinds of crackpot schemes up here. They still do. The only thing wrong with the schemes is that, given our present state of knowledge, the schemes won't work. Scientists on the order of Dr. Hunnicker aren't supposed to fill the little gaps. I remember shortly before Felix died, there was a marine general who was hounding him to do something about mud. Oh my god, why is this happening? This never used to happen. Okay, it's not gonna work. Whatever. Do something about mud? The Marines, after almost 200 years of wallowing in mud, were sick of it, said Dr. Breed. The general, as their spokesman, felt that one of the aspects of progress should be that marines no longer have to fight in mud. What did the general have in mind? The absence of mud. No more mud. I suppose, I theorized, it might be possible with mountains of some sort of chemical or tons of some sort of machinery... What the general had in mind was a little pill or a little machine. Not only were the marines sick of mud, they were sick of carrying cumbersome objects. They wanted something little to carry for a change. What did Dr. Honecker say? In his playful way, and all his ways were playful, Felix suggested that there might be a single grain of something, even a microscopic grain, that could make infinite expanses of muck, marsh, swamp, creeks, pools, quicksand, and mire as solid as this desk. Dr. Breed banged on his, spec his speckled old fist on the desk. The desk was a kidney-shaped, sea-green steel affair. One Marine could carry more than enough of the stuff to free an armored division bogged down in the Everglades. According to Felix, one Marine could carry enough of the stuff under the nail of his little finger. T that's impossible. You would say so. I would say so. Practically everybody would say so. To Felix, in his playful way, it was entirely possible. The miracle of Felix, and I sincerely hope you'll put this in your book somewhere was that he always approached old puzzles as though they were brand new. <laughs> I feel like Francine Pefko now, I said, and all the girls in the girl pool, too. Dr. Hunterker could never have explained to me how something that could be carried under a fingernail could make a swamp as solid as your desk. I told you what a good explainer Felix was. Even so, he was able to explain it to me, said Dr. Breed, and I'm sure I can explain it to you. The puzzle is how to get Marines out of the mud, right? Right. All right, said Dr. Breed. Listen carefully. Here we go. Chapter 20. Ice 9. There are several rays, Dr. Breed said to me, in which certain liquids can crystallize, can freeze, several ways in which their atoms can stack and lock in an orderly, rigid way. That old man with spotted hands invited me to think of the several ways in which cannonballs might be stacked on a courthouse lawn or of the several ways in which oranges might be packed into a crate. So it is with atoms and crystals, too, and two different crystals of the same substance can have quite different physical properties. He told me about a factory that had been growing big crystals of ethylene diamine tartrate, 
The crystals were used in certain manufacturing operations, he said. But one day, the factory discovered that the crystals it was growing no longer had the properties desired. The atoms had begun to stack and lock, to freeze, in a different fashion. The liquid that was crystallizing hadn't changed, but the crystals it was forming were, as far as industrial applications went, pure junk. How this had come about was a mystery. A theoretical villain, however, was what Dr. Breed called a seed. He meant that a tiny grain of the undesired crystal pattern, the seed which had come from God only knows where, taught the atoms the novel way in which to stack and lock, to crystallize, to freeze. Now think about cannonballs on a courthouse lawn, or about oranges in a crate again, he suggested, and he helped me see that the pattern of the bottom layer of cannonballs of or, or of oranges determined how each subsequent layer would stack and lock. The bottom layer is the seed of how every cannonball or every orange that comes after is going to behave, even to an infinite number of cannonballs or oranges. Now suppose chortled Dr. Breed, enjoying himself, that there were many possible ways in which water could crystallize, could freeze. Suppose that the sort of ice we skate upon and put into highballs, what we might call ice one, is only one of several types of ice. Suppose that water always froze as ice one on Earth because it had never found a seed to teach it how to form ice two, ice three, ice four. And suppose, he rapped on his desk with his old hand again, that there were one form, which we will call ice nine, a crystal as hard as this desk, with a melting point of, let us say, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or better still, a melting point of 130 degrees. All right, I'm, I'm still with you, I said. Dr. Breed was interrupted by whispers in his outer office, whispers loud and pretentious. They were the sounds of the girl pool. The girls were preparing to sing in the outer office. And they did sing as Dr. Breed and I appeared in the doorway. Each of about a hundred girls had made herself into a choir girl by putting on a collar of white bond paper secured by a paper clip. They sang beautifully. I was surprised and mawkishly heartbroken. I'm always moved by that seldom used treasure, the sweetness with which most girls can sing. The girls sang O Little Town of Bethlehem. I'm not likely to forget very soon their interpretation of the line, The hopes and fears of all the years are here with us tonight. Chapter 21, The Marines March On When old Dr. Breed, with the help of Miss Faust, had passed out the Christmas chocolate bars to the girls, we returned to his office. There, he said to me, where were we? Oh, yes. And that old man asked me to think of United States Marines in a godforsaken swamp. Their trucks and tanks and howitzers are wallowing, he complained, sinking and stinking my asthma news. He raised a finger and winked to me. But suppose, young man, that one marine had with him a tiny capsule containing a seed of Ice-9, a new way for the atoms of water to stack and lock, to freeze. If that marine threw that seed into the nearest puddle, the puddle would freeze, I guessed. And all the muck around the puddle? It would freeze. And all the puddles in the frozen muck? They would freeze. And the pools and streams in the frozen muck? They would freeze? You bet they would, he cried, and the United States Marines would rise from the swamp and march on. Chapter 22. Member of the Yellow Press. There is such stuff? I asked. No, 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 said Dr. Breed, losing patience with me again. I only told you all this in order to give you some insight into the extraordinary novelty of the ways in which Felix was likely to approach an old problem. What I've just told you is what he told the Marine General, who was hounding him about mud. Felix ate alone here in the cafeteria every day. It was a rule that no one was to sit with him, to interrupt his chain of thought. But the Marine General barged in, pulled up a chair, and started talking about mud. What I've told you was Felix's offhand reply. That there really isn't such a thing. I just told you there wasn't, cried Dr. Breed hotly. Felix died shortly after that, and if you'd been listening to what I've been trying to tell you about pure research men, you wouldn't ask such a question. Pure research men work on what fascinates them, not what fascinates other people. I keep thinking about that swamp. You can stop thinking about it. I've made the only point I wanted to make with the swamp. If the streams flowing through the swamp froze as ice nine, what about the rivers and lakes the streams fed? They'd freeze, but there is no such thing as ice nine. And the oceans the rivers fed? They'd freeze, of course, he snapped. I suppose you're going to rush to market with a sensational story about ice nine now. I tell you again, it does not exist. 
and the springs feeding the frozen lakes and streams, and all the water underground feeding the springs? They'd freeze, damn it! he cried. But if I'd known that you were a member of the Yellow Press, he said grandly, rising to his feet, I wouldn't have wasted a minute with you. And the rain? When it fell, it would freeze into hard little hobnails of Ice Nine, and that would be the end of the world. And the end of the interview, too. Goodbye. Chapter 23. The Last Batch of Brownies. Dr. Breed was mistaken about at least one thing. There was such a thing as Ice Nine. And Ice Nine was on Earth. Ice Nine was the last gift Felix Hunnaker created for mankind before going to his just reward. He did it without anyone's realizing what he was doing. He did it without leaving any records of what he'd done. True, elaborate apparatus was necessary in the act of creation, but it already existed in the research laboratory. Dr. Hunnaker had only to go on calling on laboratory neighbors, borrowing this and that, making a winsome neighborhood nuisance of himself, until, so to speak, he had baked his last batch of brownies. He had made a chip of Ice-9. It was blue-white. It had a melting point of 114.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Felix Hunnaker had put the chip in a little bottle, and he had put the bottle in his pocket, and he had gone to his cottage on Cape Cod with his three children, there intending to celebrate Christmas. Angela had been 34. Frank had been 24. Little Newt had been 18. The old man had died on Christmas Eve, having told only his children about Ice Nine. His children had divided the Ice Nine among themselves. I think that's a good place to stop for now. Next time we will pick up with chapter 24, What a Womp Eater Is. Chapter 24, What a Womp Eater Is. Which brings me to the Bukunanist concept of a womp eater. A womp eater is the pivot of a caress. No caress is without a womp eater, Bukunan tells us, just as, uh, just as no wheel is without a hub. Anything can be a womp eater, a tree, a rock, an animal, an idea, a book, a melody, the holy grail. Whatever it is, the members of its caress revolve around it in the majestic chaos of a spiral nebula. The orbits of the members of a caress about their common womp eater are spiritual orbits, naturally. It is souls and not bodies that revolve. As Baconan invites us to sing, Around, around, around we spin with feet of lead and wings of tin. And womp eaters come and womp eaters go, Baconan tells us. At any given time, a caress actually has two womp eaters, one waxing in importance and one waning. I am almost certain that while I was talking to Dr. Breed and Ilium, the womp eater of my caress that was just coming into bloom was that crystalline form of water, that white-blue gem, that seed of doom called Ice Nine. While I was talking to Dr. Breed and Ilium, Angela Franklin and Newton Hunnaker had in their possession seeds of Ice Nine, seeds grown from their father's seed, chips, in a manner of speaking, off the old block. What was to become of those chips was... I am convinced, a principal concern of my caress. Chapter 25. The main thing about Dr. Hunnaker. So much for now for the womp eater of my caress. After my unpleasant interview with Dr. Breed in the research laboratory of the General Forge and Foundry Company, I was put into the hands of Miss Faust. Her orders were to show me the door. I prevailed upon her, however, to show me the laboratory of the late Dr. Hunnaker first. En route, I asked her how well she had known Dr. Hunnaker. She gave me a frank and interesting reply, and a piquant smile to go with it. I don't think he was knowable. I mean, when most people talk about knowing somebody a lot or a little, they're talking about secrets they've been told or haven't been told. They're talking about intimate things, family things, love things. That nice old lady said to me, Dr. Hunnaker had all those things in his life, the way every living person has to, but they weren't the main things with him. What were the main things? I asked her. Dr. Breed keeps telling me the main thing with Dr. Hunnaker was truth. 
you don't seem to agree. I don't know whether I agree or not. I just have trouble understanding how truth, all by itself, could be enough for a person. Miss Faust was ripe for Buchananism. Chapter 26. What God is. Did you ever talk to Dr. Honecker? I asked Miss Faust. Oh, certainly. I talked to him a lot. Do any conversations stick in your mind? There was one where he bet I couldn't tell him anything that was absolutely true. So I said to him, God is love. And what did he say? He said, what is God? What is love? Huh. But God really is love, you know, said Miss Faust, no matter what Dr. Honecker said. Chapter 27, Men from Mars. The room that had been the laboratory of Dr. Felix Honecker was on the sixth floor, the top floor of the building. A purple cord had been stretched across the doorway, and a brass plate on the wall explained why the room was sacred. In this room, Dr. Felix Honecker, Nobel laureate in physics, spent the last 28 years of his life. Where he was, there was the frontier of knowledge. The importance of this one man in the history of mankind is incalculable. Miss Faust offered to unshackle the, pop, the purple cord for me so that I might go inside and traffic more intimately with whatever ghosts there were. I accepted. It's just as he left it she said, except that there were rubber bands all over one counter. Rubber bands? Don't ask me what for. Don't ask me what any of this is for. The old man had left the laboratory a mess. What engaged my attention at once was the quantity of cheap toys lying around. There was a paper kite with a broken spine. There was a toy gyroscope wound with string, ready to whir and balance itself. There was a top. There was a bubble pipe. There was a fishbowl with a castle and two turtles in it. He loved ten-cent stores, said Miss Faust. I can see he did. Some of his most famous experiments were performed with equipment that cost less than a dollar. <laughs> a penny saved is a penny earned. There were numerous pieces of conventional laboratory equipment, too, of course, but they seemed drab accessories to the cheap gay toys. Dr. Hunnaker's desk was piled with correspondence. I don't think he ever answered a letter, mused Miss Faust. People had to get him on the telephone or come to see him if they wanted an answer. There was a framed photograph on his desk. Its back was towards me, and I ventured to guess as to whose picture it was. His wife? No. One of his children? Nope. Himself? No. So I took a look. I found that the picture was of a humble little war memorial in the front of a small town courthouse. Part of the memorial was a sign that gave the names of those villagers who had died in various wars, and I thought that sign must be the reason for the photograph. I could read the names, and I half expected to find the name Honecker among them. It wasn't there. That was one of his hobbies, said Miss Faust. What was? Photographing how cannonballs are stacked on different courthouse lawns. Apparently how they've got them stacked in that picture is very unusual. I see. He was an unusual man. I agree. Maybe in a million years everybody will be as smart as he was and see the way things he did, but compared with the average person of today, he was a, as different as a man from Mars. Maybe he really was a Martian, I suggested. <laughs> that would certainly go a long way toward explaining his three kids. Chapter 28, Mayonnaise. While Miss Faust and I waited for an elevator to take us to the first floor, Miss Faust said she'd hoped the elevator that came would not be number five. Before I could ask her why this was a reasonable wish, number five arrived. Its operator was a small and ancient black man whose name was Lyman Enders Knowles. Knowles was insane, I'm almost sure. Offensively so, in that he grabbed his own behind and cried, Yes, yes, whenever he felt that he'd made a point. Hello, fellow anthropoids in lily pads and paddle wheels, he said to Miss Faust and me. Yes, yes. First floor, please, said Miss Faust coldly. All Knowles had to do was close the door and get us to the first floor with the press of a button, but he wasn't going to do that yet. He wasn't going to do it maybe for years. Man told me, he said, that these here elevators was Mayan architecture. I never knew that till today, and I says to him, what's that make me? Mayonnaise? Yes, yes. And while he was thinking that over, I hit him with a question that straightened him up and made him think twice as hard. Yes, yes. 
Could we please go down, Mr. Knowles? begged Miss Faust. I said to him, said Knowles, this here's a research laboratory. Research means look again, don't it? Means they're looking for something they found once and it got away somehow. And now they gotta research for it? How come they gotta build a building? <clears throat> how come they gotta build a building like this with mayonnaise, elevators, and all? And fill it with all these crazy people? What is it they're trying to find again? Who lost what? Yes, yes. It's very interesting, sighed Miss Faust. Now, could we go down? Only way we can go is down, barked Knowles. This here's the top. He asked me to go up and wouldn't be a thing I could do for you. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, so let's go down, said Miss Faust. <laughs> Very soon now. This gentleman here had been paying his respects to Dr. Hunnaker. Yes, I said. D did you know him? Intimately, he said. You know what I said when he died? No. I said, Dr. Hunnaker, he ain't dead. Is that right? Just entered a new dimension, yes, yes. He punched a button, and down we went. Did you know the Hunnaker children? I asked him. Babies full of rabies, he said. Yes, yes. End of chapter 28. Chapter 29. Gone, but not forgotten. There was one more thing I wanted to do in Ilium. I wanted to get a photograph of the old man's tomb. So I went back to my room, found Sandra gone, picked up my camera, and hired a cab. Sleet was still coming down, acid and gray. I thought the old man's tombstone and all that sleet might photograph pretty well. Might even make a good picture for the jacket of the day the world ended. The custodian at the cemetery gate told me how to find the Hunnaker burial plot. Can't miss it, he said. It's got the biggest marker in the place. He did not lie. The marker was an alabaster phallus, 20 feet high and 3 feet thick. It was plastered with sleet. By God, I exclaimed, getting out of the cab with my camera. How's that for a suitable memorial to the father of the atom bomb? I laughed. I asked the driver if he'd mind standing by the monument in order to give some idea of scale. And then I asked him to wipe away some of the sleet so the name of the deceased would show. He did so, and there on the shaft, in letters six inches high, so help me God, was the word mother. Chapter 30. Only Sleeping. Mother? asked the driver incredulously. I wiped away more sleet and uncovered this poem. Mother, mother, how I pray for you to guard us every day. Angela Hunnaker. And under this poem was yet another. You are not dead, but only sleeping. We should smile and stop our weeping. Franklin Hunnaker. And underneath this, inset in the shaft, was a square of cement bearing the imprint of an infant's hand. Behind the, beneath the imprint were the words, Baby Newt. If that's mother, said the driver, where in the hell could they have, could they have, uh, what in the hell could they have raised over father? He made an obscene suggestion as to what the appropriate marker might be. We found father close by. His memorial, as specified in his will, I later discovered, was a marble cube, 40 centimeters on each side. Father, it said.
Chapter 31, Another Breed As we were leaving the cemetery, the driver of the cab worried about the condition of his own mother's grave. He asked if I would mind taking a short detour to look at it. It was a pathetic little stone that marked his mother, not that it mattered, and the driver asked me if I would mind another brief detour, this time to a tombstone sales room across the street from the cemetery. I wasn't a Baconanist then, so I agreed with some peevishness. As a Baconanist, of course, I would have agreed gaily to go anywhere anyone suggested. As Baconan says, peculiar travel suggestions are dancing lessons from God. The name of the tombstone establishment was Avram Breed and Sons. As the driver talked to the salesman, I wandered among the monuments. Blank monuments. Monuments in memory of nothing so far. I found a little institutional joke in the showroom. Over a stone angel hung mistletoe. Cedar bows were heaped on her pedestal, and around her marble throat was a necklace of Christmas tree lamps. How much for her? I asked the salesman. Not for sale. She's a hundred years old. My great-grandfather Avram Breed carved her. This business is that old? That's right. And you're a breed? The fourth generation in this location. Any relation to Dr. Asa Breed, the director of the research laboratory? He's my brother. He said his name was Marvin Breed. <laughs> it's a small world, I observed. When you put it in a cemetery, it is. Marvin Breed was sleek and vulgar, a smart and sentimental man. Chapter 32. Dynamite Money. I just came from your brother's office. I'm a writer. I was interviewing him uh, about Dr. Honecker. I said to Marvin Breed. There was one queer son of a bitch. Not my brother, I mean Honecker. Did you sell him that monument for his wife? <laughs> I sold his kids that. He didn't have anything to do with it. He never got around to putting any kind of marker on her grave. And then, after she'd been dead for a year or more, Honecker's three kids came in here. The big, tall girl, the boy, and the little baby. They wanted the biggest stone money could buy. And the two older ones had poems they'd written. They wanted the poems on the stone. You can laugh at that stone if you want to said Marvin Breed, but those kids got more consolation out of that than anything else money could have bought. They used to come in and look at it and put flowers on it I don't know how many times a year. Must have cost a lot. Nobel Prize money bought it. Two things that money bought. Cottage on Cape Cod and that monument. Dynamite money. I marveled, thinking of the violence of dynamite and the absolute repose of a tombstone in a summer home. What? Nobel. Invented dynamite. <laughs> well, I guess it takes all kinds. Had I been a Baconanist then, pondering the miraculously intricate chain of events that had brought dynamite money to that particular tombstone company, I might have whispered, Busy, busy, busy. Busy, busy, busy is what we Baconanists whisper whenever we think of how complicated and unpredictable the machinery of life is. But all I could say as a Christian then was, Life sure is funny sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes it isn't, said Marvin Breed. I asked Marvin Breed if he'd known Emily Hunnicker, the wife of Felix, the mother of Angela Frank and Newt, the woman under that monstrous shaft. Know her? His voice turned tragic. Did I know her, mister? Sure, I knew her. I knew Emily. We went to Ilium High together. We were co-chairman of the class colors committee then. Her father owned the Ilium Music Store. She could play every musical instrument there was. I fell so hard for her, I gave up football and tried to play the violin. Then my big brother Asa came home from spring for spring vacation from MIT, and I made the mistake of introducing him to my best girl. Marvin Breed snapped his fingers. He took her away from me just like that. I smashed up my $75 violin on a big brass knob at the foot of my bed. I went down to a florist shop and got the kind of box they put a dozen roses in. And I put the busted fiddle in the box and I sent it to her by a Western Union messenger boy. <laughs> Pretty, was she? Pretty, he echoed. Mister, when I see my first lady angel, if God ever sees fit to show me one, it'll be her wings and not her face that'll make my mouth fall open. Because I've already seen the prettiest face that could ever be. The one a man in Ilium County wasn't in love with her, secretly or otherwise. She could have had any man she wanted. He spit on his own floor. She had to go marry that little Dutch son of a bitch. She was engaged to my brother, and that sneaky little bastard hit town. Marvin Breed snapped his fingers again. 
took her away from my big brother like that. I suppose it's high treason and ungrateful and ignorant and backward and anti-intellectual to call a dead man as famous as Felix Hunnaker a son of a bitch. I know all about how harmless and gentle and dreamy he was supposed to be. How he'd never hurt a fly, how he didn't care about money and power and fancy clothes and automobiles and things. You know, how he wasn't like the rest of us. How he was better than the rest of us. How he was so in innocent, he was practically a Jesus except for the Son of God part. Marvin Breed felt it was unnecessary to complete his thought, but I had to ask him to do it. But what? He said, but what? We went to a window, looking at the cemetery gate. But what? He murmured at the gate and the sleet and the Honecker shaft that could be dimly seen. But, he said, but how the hell, but how the hell innocent is a man who helps make a thing like the atomic bomb? How could you say a man had a good mind when he couldn't even bother to do anything when the best-hearted, most beautiful woman in the world, his own wife, was dying for lack of love and understanding? He shuddered. Sometimes I wonder if he wasn't born dead. I never met a man who was less interested in the living. Sometimes I think that's the trouble with the world. Too many people in high places who are stone-cold dead. End of chapter 33「He was standing in front of it with tears in his eyes. Marvin Breed was still staring out the window at the cemetery gate, having just said his piece about Felix Honecker. That little Dutch son of a bitch may have been a modern holy man, he added, but goddamn if he ever did anything he didn't want to, and goddamn if he didn't get everything he ever wanted. Music, he said. Pardon me? That's why she married him. She said his mind was tuned to the biggest music there was. The music of the stars. He shook his head. Crap. And then the gate reminded him of the last time he'd seen Frank Honecker, the model maker, the tormentor of bugs and jars. Frank, he said. What about him? Last I saw that poor queer kid was when he came out through that cemetery gate. His father's funeral was still going on. The old man wasn't underground yet. and Out through that gate came Frank. He raised his thumb at the first car that came by. It was a new Pontiac with a Florida license plate. It stopped. Frank got in it. That was the last anybody in Ilium ever saw of him. I hear he's wanted by the police. That was an accident. A freak. Frank wasn't any criminal. He didn't have that kind of nerve. The only work he ever was good at was model making. The only job he ever held on to was at Jack's Hobby Shop, selling models, making models, giving people advice on how to make models. When he cleared out of here, he went to Florida. He got a job at a model shop in Sarasota. Turned out the model shop was a front for a ring that stole Cadillacs, ran him straight on board old LSTs and shipped him to Cuba. That's how Frank got balled up and all that. I expect the reason the cops haven't found him is he's dead. He just heard too much while he was sticking turrets on the battleship Missouri with Duco cement. Where's Newt now? Do you know? I guess he's with his sister in Indianapolis. Last I heard, he got mixed up with that Russian midget and flunked out of pre-med at Cornell. Can you imagine a midget trying to become a doctor? And in that same miserable family, there's that great big gawky girl over six feet tall. That man who's so famous for having a great mind, he pulled that girl out of high school in her sophomore year so she could go on having some, so he could go on having some woman take care of him. 
All she had going for her was the clarinet she'd played in the Ilium High School band, the Marching Hundred. After she left school, said Breed, nobody ever asked her out. She didn't have any friends, and the old man never thought to give her any money to go anywhere. You know what she used to do? Uh, no. Every so often at night, she'd lock herself in her room, and she'd play records, and she'd play along with the records on her clarinet. The miracle of this age, as far as I'm concerned, is that that woman ne ever got herself a husband. How much do you want for this angel? asked the cab driver. I've told you, it's not for sale. Don't suppose there's anybody around who can do that kind of cutting anymore, I observed. I've got a nephew who can, said Breed. Ace's boy. He was all set up to be a heap big research scientist, and they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, and the kid quit, and he got drunk. And he came out here... Tell me when to go to work cutting stone. He works here now? He's a sculptor in Rome. Somebody offered you enough, said the driver. You'd take it, wouldn't you? Might, but it would be a lot of money. Who's calling me? Nobody. Why would you put a name on a thing like this, said the driver. There's a name already on it, on the pedestal. We couldn't see the name because of the bows back to get to the pedestal. It was never called for, I wanted to know. It was never paid for. The way the story goes, this German immigrant was on his way west with his wife. She died of smallpox here in Ilium, so he ordered this angel to be put up over her, and he showed my great-grandfather he had the cash to pay for it. But then he was robbed. Somebody took practically every cent he had. All he had left in this world was some land that he bought in Indiana land he'd never even seen. So he moved on, said he'd be back later to pay for the angel. But he never came back, I asked. Nope. Marvin Breed nudged some of the bows aside with his toes so that we could see the raised letters on the pedestal. There was a last name written there. There's a screwy name for you, he said. If that immigrant had any descendants, I expect they Americanized that name. They're probably Jones or Black or Thompson now. There you're wrong, I murmured. The room seemed to tip, and its walls and ceiling and floor were transformed momentarily into the mouths of many tunnels, tunnels leading in all directions through time. I had a Baconanist kind of vision of the unity in every second of all time and all wandering mankind, all wandering womankind, and all wandering children. There you're wrong, I said when the vision was gone. <laughs> what, do you know some people by that name? Yeah. That name was my last name, too. Chapter 35, Hobby Shop On the way back to the hotel, I caught sight of Jack's Hobby Shop, the place where Franklin Hunnicker had worked. I told the cab driver to stop and wait. I went in and found Jack himself presiding over his teeny-weeny fire engines, railroad, trains, airplanes, boats, houses, lampposts, trees, tanks, rockets, automobiles, porters, conductors, policemen, firemen, monuments, Mommies, daddies, cats, dogs, chickens, soldiers, ducks, and cows. He was a cadaverous man, a serious man, a dirty man, and he coughed a lot. What kind of boy was Franklin Honecker? He echoed, and he coughed and coughed. He shook his head, and he showed me that he adored Frank as much as he'd ever adored anybody. That isn't a question I have to answer with words. <coughs> I can show you what kind of a boy Franklin Honecker was. He coughed. You, you can look, he said, and you can judge for yourself. And he took me down into the basement of his store. He lived down there. There was a double bed and a dresser and a hot plate. Jack apologized for the unmade bed. My wife left me a week ago. <coughs> Still trying to pull the strings of my life back together. Then he turned on a switch, and the far end of the basement was filled with a blinding light. We approached the light and found that it was sunshine to a fantastic little country built on plywood. An island as perfectly rectangular as a township in Kansas. Any restless soul, any soul seeking to find what lay beyond its green boundaries, really would fall off the edge of the world. The details were so exquisitely in scale, so cunningly textured and tinted, that it was unnecessary for me to squint in order to believe that the nation was real. The hills, the lakes, the rivers, the forests, the towns, and all else that good natives everywhere hold so dear. And everywhere ran a spaghetti pattern of railroad tracks. Look at the doors of the houses, said Jack reverently. <sighs> Neat. Keen. They've got real knobs on them, and the knockers really work.
God. You ask what kind of a boy Franklin Hunnicker was? He built this. Jack choked up. All by himself? Uh, I helped some, but anything I did was according to his plans. The kid was a genius. How could anybody argue with you? His kid brother was a midget, you know. I know. He did some of the soldering underneath. It sure looks real. Wasn't easy, and it wasn't done overnight, either. Rome wasn't built in a day. That kid didn't have any home life, you know. That's what I've heard. This... <coughs> this was his real home. Thousands of hours he spent down here. Sometimes he wouldn't even run the trains. Just sit and look. The way we're doing. There's a lot to see. It's practically like a trip to Europe. There are so many things to see if you look close. He'd see things you and I wouldn't see. He'd all of a sudden tear down a hill that would look just as real as any hill you ever saw to you and me. And he'd be right, too. He'd put a lake where that hill had been and a trestle over the lake, and it would look ten times as good as it did before. It's not a talent that everybody has. That's right, <laughs> said Jack passionately. The passion cost him another coughing fit. When the fit was over, his eyes were watering copiously. Listen, I told that kid he should go to college and study some engineering so he could go work for American Flyer or somebody like that. Somebody big. Somebody who'd really back all the ideas he had. It looks to me as if you backed him a good deal. I wish I had. I wish I could have, mourned Jack. I didn't have the capital. I gave him stuff whenever I could, but most of the stuff he bought out of what he earned working upstairs for me. He didn't spend a dime on anything but this. He didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't go to movies, didn't go out with girls. He wasn't car crazy. This country could certainly use a few more of those. Jack shrugged. Well, I guess the Florida gangsters got him. Afraid he'd talk. Guess they did. Jack suddenly broke down and cried. Wonder if those dirty sons of bitches, he sobbed, have any idea what it was they killed. End of chapter 35. So next time we'll be starting with chapter 36, which is called Meow. <laughs>